when Second Chronicles chapter 34, and I will begin reading from verse 1. Here is what the Bible says. I'm going to read it here. Josiah was eight years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 31 years. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and followed the ways of his father, David, not turning aside to the right or to the left. In the eighth year of his reign, while he was still young, he began to seek the God of his father, David. In his twelfth year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem of, his, of high places, ashrapoles, and idols. Under his direction, the altars of Baals were torn down. He cut to pieces the incense altars that were above them and smashed the Asherah poles and the idols. These he broke to pieces and scattered over the graves of those who had sacrificed to them. He, buried, he burned the bones of the priests on their altars, and so, per, so he purged Judah and Jerusalem. In the towns of Manasseh, Ephraim, and Simeon, as far as Nephtali, and in the, and in the ruins around them, he tore down the altars and the Asherah poles and crushed the idols to powder and cut to pieces all the incense altars around Israel, throughout Israel. Then he went back to Jerusalem. In the eighth year of his reign, in the eighth year of Josiah's reign, to purify the land and the temple, he sent Shaphan, son of Azaliah, and Messiah, the ruler of the city, with Joah, the son of Jeroaz, the recorder, to repair the temple of the Lord. So, there's no question that today, if you look around in our nation, our country, and the world, there's no question that what we need is a revival. What we need is a visitation from God. And if you also look at your own life, what you will see is that your greatest need is God. The greatest need is for us to encounter the Lord. And every generation, people talk about revival. Every generation, people desire it. Christians want it. All it means, all a revival is, is really just the Holy Spirit taking back its right, His rightful place in the church. That's really what a revival is. It is God coming, the Holy Spirit taking center stage again and leading people back to loving the Lord and back to loving God. And at this point in Israel, when Josiah comes in, it is a mess. The country is a mess. Um, there have been, his grandfather was a wicked man, I was, we'll see in a second, so was his dad. And, but a revival happens under Josiah. And I wanna talk about what it takes um, for that to happen. I have been in places where they have so-called revivals happen. I think I mentioned here one time, I was in one country one time where, um, somewhere in Europe, where I, I was there for a conference and decided to go and just see, visit the church, go see how the people from that place worship. Someone took me there and also served as my interpreter. and. In the meeting, it turned um, into one of the saddest things that I have seen in church, where the quote-unquote revivalist visiting minister called people to, um, he turned up light, they turned up high tempo music, they called everyone who wanted to lose weight to come forward and jump up and down. I kid you not, this happened. Lots of sisters went up. Um, to, 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 to try to lose weight. It's true. And at one point he asked people who wanted money to bring their wallets and, and up front to the altar and he was going to pray and money would appear in their wallet. Everybody went for it. You know, every single person in the audience. I was left alone sitting in the middle, including my translator, who's a good person, he's a good man, but it went, and using some scripture, the Peter, the fish, the coin, and that sort of thing. And um, 
and it lasted about three hours. And at the end of which, the gentleman who was leading the thing asked me, what did you think of this? Speaking to a translator, I said to him, this is not Jesus Christ. You need to give Jesus to people. Because we don't have time, we don't go to church to be entertained. We don't go to church um, to play games. And I said that respectfully to this gentleman. He was old enough to be my father. So I spoke to him respectfully, but honestly. The Bible said, do not rebuke an older man harshly, says, uh, Paul says to Timothy. But all that to say, but there is something, there is a real there is a real, there's such a thing as a real move of the Holy Spirit. Whenever you see a counterfeit, it's because the real thing does exist. And the real thing is valuable. That's why a counterfeit happens. And so, but we have to get back to the scripture to see what a real thing, the genuine, looks like. And here you have it. This is, this is, why, this is an example of revival and how it happens. So the Bible says here, Again, Chronicles chapter 34, verse 1. Josiah was eight years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 31 years. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and walked in the ways of his father David, not turning to the left or to the right. Now, that is quite a summary of a man's life. 31 years, and he walked straight with the Lord. That's a long time for a man to remain faithful. How did he get like that? And how did this revival here happen? Number one, verse three, in the eighth year of his reign, while he was still young, he began to seek the God of his father, David. How did he become like, how, how, how was it that he walked for 31 years like David the king did? because he began to seek the God of his father, David. At the beginning of any genuine walk with God, all move of God, all genuine spiritual growth, there is this. It begins with a person who wants to seek God. He's not seeking money, was not seeking fame, he was not seeking position in a church, he wasn't seeking to be known. He was seeking God. He was seeking the Lord. And you, you see that here with, with, with this man, Josiah. And he began to do this, the Bible said, while he was still young. Well, how young was he? It says in the eighth year of his reign. And he became a king at eight years old, which, by the way, is quite astonishing that there was an eight-year-old eight old, and people who, were, who knew God and who had the right spirit, they submitted to the, to, to the child and honored him as king. But at eight, in the eighth year of his reign, he began to seek the Lord, the God of his father. He, he was 16 years old. At 16 years old, he did not say, I don't have time for God, I have to play video games. I need to know how to get to that next level in the game. I need to go and know how to get to 2,000 points or whatever. It, it, it's in there. He was seeking God, the God of his father, David. Everybody, young and old, if you are a believer, even a non-believer, at some point in your life, you felt a call to begin to seek God. And maybe you are receiving it today. God was calling you, saying, take some time away from Twitter, from Snapchat, from all these other things. Take some, cut down on that. Stop looking at your phone at the end of every week, and it says you spent an average of 16 hours of screen time, most of which was spent on things that are just a waste. Start seeking me. You heard that call. Others may not have heard it, but you heard it. God began to move in your heart and tell you, now is the time. Come and seek after me. You might have been six years old. You might have been 60 years old. You might have been 80 years old when that time came. But you received that call. 
And no one told Josiah to do this. No one forced him to do this. But he knew that he had to seek the Lord. And I want to say this. Let me speak specifically. Since it mentions here that he was young. Um, let me speak to young folks who are here or may watch this later. The pastor's job is not to seek God for you. Your parents cannot seek God for you. The church cannot seek God for you. You have to seek God for yourself. It's a personal relationship that you have. God has no grandchildren. He has no nephews. He only has children. You need to seek the Lord for yourself, and you, have, and you have to make time for it. That means there are certain things you will not be able to do. And let me tell you what happens to a person who does that. They are preparing their lives to be a life where God moves. A church that seeks God is a church that is preparing itself for God to move. Where do I get that from, from, the, from the Word of God? The Bible says that um, there, there are three scriptures that I will, I will show you about seeking, seeking the Lord. Can we put that, that up? Let, let's first do J Jeremiah chapter uh, 29, 11 to 13, if we have it. God said to the people of Israel, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. God had plans for them, but they had to call on God. They had to pray, and they had to seek the Lord with all of their heart so that those plans get fulfilled. You often see that verse 11 by itself. And that's why it's, it, it's not good to read a verse by itself and not get the context. I have know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper and not to harm you, but you ought to seek the Lord and call on Him. Those plans won't just come to pass like that. Now it is interesting that how, how, did, um, how, did, how did Josiah seek the Lord? He must have sought the Lord with all, if, with all of his heart, because it says it there, because he did find God, so he must have sought the Lord with all of his heart. And not only that, the Bible says that if we seek God, we have to seek him first. So it says in Matthew chapter 6, 33, that Seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness, which means if you're not seeking it first, you're probably not seeking it. We seek the Lord with all of our hearts. We seek him first. And in Hebrews 11:6, one of the greatest promises in the Bible, without faith it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who do what? Earnestly seek him. Do you see that every time that there is something about seeking God, there's always a qualifier. Seek with all of his heart. Seek um, first. Seek earnestly. It means that seeking God is serious business. It's something that you need to invest time, your whole being, mind, emotions, time, resources into. And that's why he began to know. It is interesting, he did not have a Bible. It appears he did not. So all he must have been doing was praying. And check this out. It took him four years. He didn't see God for a day, for two days, for a week. From 16 years old to 20 years old, this guy, a king, sought the Lord. Because it says in the twelfth year, if you can go back to Second Chronicles 34, in the twelfth year of his reign, in, ver in verse 3 there, he began to purge Jerusalem of the high places, the Asherah pole, the carved idols, and the cast images. He began a purge. This is, the, this is the second thing that happens. If you want a revival in your life, if we want a revival as a church, there are no shortcuts. 
We need to seek the Lord, but we also need to begin some purging. By purging, I mean purging your own life. Listen to what he says here. He cut down, he, 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 he dealt with the sin that was in his society. The sins that were obvious, idolatry, which God had said should not be done. The obvious commands of the Lord. Here is what he's, look at the language that he, that he uses here. Uh, I, I, I counted at least 10 terms that are aggressive. He purged, verse 3. I'm reading from the NIV 1984. Tear down, verse 4. Cut to pieces, verse 4. Smashed, verse 4. Broke to pieces, verse 4. Burned, verse 5. Purged, verse 5. Tore down, verse 7. Crushed, verse 7. Cut to pieces, verse 7. This is what he did to idols, asherah poles, and all the detestable things that were in his society. He dealt with it radically. These are not the kind of terms that are often used today in church. But this is the way to deal with sin. The, we can talk about revival, we can say we want God, but at the end of the day, whether we're serious about it or not, comes down to what unclean things we allow in our lives. Let me ask you a question. For Josiah, these were some very filthy things that God did not like. Um, the, the altars of Baal, the god of money, the god of prosperity, Ashrah poles, which was uh, uh, an, an abominable pole with some sexual connotations to it. And it, they, they knew it was wrong. But no one had done anything about it. They were there. And we don't know how long exactly this had been there, but we do know, by the way, that for about 70 years, there was no prophet that we know of. Between Isaiah and Zephaniah, who is the prophet who shows up actually during the reign of, of, uh, of, of Josiah. But he, Josiah, when he came to it, he did realize... No, we, we got to purge and remove these things. This is wrong. What will happen when anybody begins to seek God, when you begin to seek God, you begin to set your heart to seek the Lord. God is going to begin to show you things that you have to purge out of your life. And I want to ask you today, what are those things for your life? What are those things in your life that you need to purge and smash and cut down and remove? Is there greed in your life that you need to cut down? Is there bitterness and hatred that you need to deal with? Is there lust that you need to deal with? Oftentimes I hear people complain that they're falling in sin. But I don't see the evidence of what they're doing to get away from it. It's like keeping a snake around you and complaining you're getting bitten. What you do is you get rid of the snake. You kill it. And when people complain about lust, for example, what are you doing to prevent yourself from watching those things? Do you have a blocker on your phone? There are, there, there, there are things like that that you can do. Is there somebody who leads you to sin? When are you going to delete their number from your phone? And stop hanging out with them. If every time you hang out with them, you end up doing things that you later regret. You, there, there, listen, there, there is no clean, nice way to deal with sin. If there was one, God who loves us would have given it to us. When Jesus talked about it, he used harsher terms than he You say this is Old Testament. Well, it is the Old Testament. But you got to go to Jesus and hear what he says. He doesn't use smash. He said, cut off your hand and pluck out your eye. Okay? It, it, it sounds more violent than this. Obviously, he did not say, literally cut your hand. Pastor C. I had a message on that. But he was saying, do whatever you can. Take it seriously and make sure that whatever leads you to sin, you take it out of your life. Without a sincere, honest dealing with the things that make our hearts our homes, our families, our church unclean. 
there will be no revival. It's just talk. It is just talk. When we become serious about getting rid of TV shows that do not honor God in our homes, when we become serious about not letting children play video games that are violent, and then later we complain that they're shooting their friends, when we become serious about these things, we are serious about having a revival. There is no shortcut to it. In the early church, there, when God was moving, you often hear that, you know, Peter, Sh Peter Shadows was healing people. You hear about things like that. But what is not often mentioned, there was no tolerance for anything that brings death in that church. There were two people, a couple, whose name were Ananias and Sapphira. They didn't commit adultery. They didn't murder anybody. They simply pretended partly for just to get honor, really just to get honor. She said, it's really what I was. And they ended up pretending someone gave, sold this property, gave all his money from the property to help the poor. And they were like, oh, that's kind of cool. Let's pretend to be doing that. So they sold them. And they only brought part, but they pretended they gave everything. They dropped dead. That's in the New Testament, by the way. Let me ask you, would you have joined that church? Would you have joined that church? It means that Peter was not himself who told them there they were going to He was not walking. In it. See, they, they dealt with falsehood. There was no, no tolerance for pretending. The purity and the power of God go together. You show me a man, you show me a woman in whose life the presence of God is, who has the hand of God on them, I will show you a man who seeks God and a man who genuinely, sincerely, candidly deals with sin in his life, in her life. There are no shortcuts. The third thing that happens here, and let me say that Josiah began in Jerusalem and then went out, in Judea and then out to the rest of Israel. We always have to begin at home. This is not for us to go judge somebody else. This is you begin in your own heart. The land today is you and me. The temple today is you and me. I want to point out this verse here oh, as I begin to wrap up here. Um, there is, in verse 11, he says um, that they gave money to the carpenters to repair the temple that the kings of Judah had allowed to fall into ruin. They had allowed it to fall into ruin. And I want you to think about what aspects of your spiritual life you have allowed to fall into ruin. See, it wasn't that ruin just happened to the house of God. The leaders, the kings, let it happen, it says there in verse 11. Whenever there's spiritual decay in the body of Christ in the churches, it's not a culture, it's not Hollywood that did it, it is the leaders, the pastor, the preachers, the teachers that neglected it. It is you, me, we, we neglected our parts of our spiritual life. We stopped seeking the Lord and it went into ruin. We are the temple of God today. We are God's land. The land, holy land of God is the believer's heart. And that's where we have to begin the purge and the cleansing Number three, thing that I want to mention here is verse 14. While they were bringing out the money that had been taken into the temple of the Lord, Hilkiah the priest found the book of the law of the Lord that had been given through Moses. And down to verse um, 16, then Shaphan took, he was the, the, he was the, 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 um, the secretary of the king, took the book to the king and reported to him, your official are doing everything that had been commended to them. They have paid out the workers. And then in verse 18, then Shaphan the secretary informed the king, Hilkiah the priest has given me a book. And Shaphan read it in the presence of the king. The, if I, they, 
they found in the temple the Bible. Most likely, the first five books of Moses, Genesis through Deuteronomy. It tells you that, wait, why should this be an event? Why should this even be a thing? Shouldn't, shouldn't you expect the book of God in God's house? But these people had backslidden so bad that they forgot they had a book. They forgot they had a book. The same one, the same Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy um, that you and I have, they forgot about it. It's even impressive how Josiah knew he should seek the Lord. But he found the book, and the Bible says they read it in the presence of the king. One of the things that has happened in the church is that we have complained so much about public school taking the Bible out of schools. You hear that often. How can they take the Bible out of school? The Bible is taken out of the schools. But the reality is, what saddens God's heart is that the Bible isn't read much in Christian homes. It sits on shelves and collects dust, and Christians don't read it that much. Listen to what uh, happened here. When he heard the word of God, likely when they read to him, probably the last part of Deuteronomy, probably Deuteronomy chapter 28 and stuff, he said, when God details the curses that will happen if they forsake the Lord, here is what uh, Josiah said. He says, go inquire of the Lord for me and for the remnant of Israel and Judah about what is written in this book that has been found. Great is the Lord anger that is poured out on us because our fathers have not kept the word of the Lord. They have not acted in accordance to all that is written in it, in this book. He recognized when he read the Bible that he and his people, and not necessarily him, but his fathers, the previous kings, had not obeyed the Lord, and that God had threatened disaster for that reason. And when he realized that, his heart was moved. He, was, he didn't shrug it off. There is another king later, actually his son, when Jeremiah writes a word of prophecy, his son takes a knife and cuts it up and throws it in the fire. One generation later. But this man heard the word of God and he was moved. The Bible says that, the Bible says, he said, let's go consult the prophet. Because in, the, in those days, in the old covenant, you go, went to a prophet to hear from the Lord. Today God speaks to us, to his children directly, uses others to confirm his word to us. But he speaks to us. And he sent someone, to, they, and they went and found this lady Hulda, the, the, the wife of, of the wardrobe keeper, the keeper of the wardrobe, and she said to them, this is what the Lord of Israel says. Tell the man who sent you to me, this is what the Lord says. I'm going to bring disaster on this place and its people. All the curses written in this book that has been read in the presence of the king of Judah because they have forsaken me and burned incense to other gods and provoked me to, un to anger by all that their hands have made. By ang my anger will be poured out on this place and will not be quenched. The other king of Judah who sent you to inquire of me, this is what the Lord of Israel says concerning the word you, 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 you heard. Let me pause there and say one thing. Even though Josiah had been, was a godly king, God seemed to be saying here, there has just been too much sin. Your grandfather, your father, grandfather, they shed so much blood. I am going to judge the nation, but I won't do it in your lifetime. We are a country, we're no more, we're, we're not godlier than these people were. In our nation, over the last 40, 50 years, millions of children have been killed in abortion clinics. I'm not singling that out, that issue, but it has to be said. America is an interesting country. We have two sides to our country. We're the country that gives more to, most to mission work than any other country. We're the country that sent out missionaries. My mother tells me that my grandfather, who was in a village in the middle of nowhere, 
was, was, had an infection or something like that that would have killed him, was rescued by American Baptist missionaries. I, I have never been in that place of the country. I don't even know how they got there in those days. That's America. And I'm grateful for that. But the other reality of America is that we're one of seven countries in the world up to this week that allow abortion in the third trimester, two of those other countries being North Korea and China. And two of those other countries even have limits in them. So, you know, it, 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 there's been a lot of bloodshed, and we deserve the judgment of God. But God in his mercy can delay judgment if people repent and pray. And here is what the Bible says here as I wrap up here on um, verse 27. This is what's the response of Josiah, and this is what I hope our response will be today. Because your heart was... Can we put up that verse, please, if we have it, Caio? Um, because your heart was responsive, number one, you humble yourself... Before your God, number two, when you heard what was spoken against this place, you humble yourself before me and you tore your robes and wept in my presence. I have heard you, declares the Lord. This is the response of a man whose heart can be moved. Now, I cannot change your heart, but I, I do want to ask you, number one, do you read the word of God? And when you read it and you see your own life in the pages of God's Word, does it move you? Have you ever wept after you read something in the Word of God because it convicted you? This was not in a church service. They read him the Bible in his home. And I want to say and beg of you, later on it says there that the king gathered the people and that's in, that's in verse, um, that's in verse 30. It said he read in the hearing, in their hearing, all the words of the book of the covenant. All the words, all the words of the book. They gathered the people and they read whatever they had in the Bible. They read the whole thing. I do want to encourage you, take the Bible and read it. I will say this to you. I, you know, I have a, reg and I don't say this to sound spiritual or sound cute or, or, or anything like that. I tell you honestly, I was reflecting about my life. I turned 40 a couple of months ago, or last month rather. I was thinking about what I would do differently. I tell you honestly, one thing that I would do differently, I'll spend more time studying this book. I spend more time in the Word of God. Not because I haven't read it. I did read it. I, I got saved when I was 10 years old. And I would read it, portions of it here and there. We'll read it at home. It wasn't until I was 15 that someone handed me a pamphlet that says, that's a church on the 1st of January that year. Um, it takes only 15 minutes a day to read the whole Bible in a year, yet most Christians have never read it. I was so convicted by that. I read it for the first time from Genesis to Revelation. After that, I was so touched by it. I read it again in six months. And then I switched. I started, back then, I was reading it in French. I started to read it in English. On that third reading, my pace slowed down. But I look back. And I wish I had spent even more time. I remember during those five years, between 10 and 50, there, there was a time there, especially one year, must have been either 14 or something. I was feeling a, a sense that, why don't you read the Word of God? Start from the beginning. And I didn't respond to that. I didn't listen to that. I regret that. Because, I, and in my 20s, even I, I, would have, I would have cut down on activities in college years. I was going around doing a lot of things in Christian activities, speaking here and there, doing things. I, I would have cut down on that and spent more time in prayer and in the Word of God by myself. 
if I were to do it all over again, I tell you the truth. Because I know what happens. I know what happens when a man seeks the Lord in prayer and in his word. I know what happened to me when I did that. And I encourage you to do that. At the end here, I would just say that Josiah celebrated the Passover with the people, a remembrance of where the country had come from, that they had come out of slavery, and because of one reason, a lamb was killed, a lamb was slain, that's in chapter 35, so that their sins were covered by the blood of that lamb. That is why they were taken out of Egypt, so that they can be a people. In fact, it says that, um, yeah, just as celebrated the Passover. Can we put that verse where it says that the Passover had never been celebrated like this until the days, since the days of, of, uh, of Samuel? Um, yeah, and the, which is an, astou- uh, an astounding statement that even David did not do it because Samuel is before David became king. This man sought the Lord and followed God so much they celebrated the Passover even more in line with what God wanted than David had. Today, there is a call for us. Jesus is our Passover. It says in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, He is our Passover. And there is a call there. Get rid of the old yeast so that you may be the unleavened batch as you really are. For Christ, our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us keep the festival, the Passover, not with bread, not with old bread leavened with malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. It's basically saying, let's celebrate Christ who died for our sins, to cover up for our misdeeds. All of us have sinned in some way, shape, or form. But it is because Jesus died on the cross that we can be rescued from that judgment.